Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mike Perry. I'm the executive director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, the Friends Group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center, located at the Army War College in Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania. The center is the Army's premier research facility on the history and heritage of the United States Army and its soldiers. Tonight, we're pleased to host uh, Colonel Retired Jeff McCausland. Uh, Colonel or Dr. McCausland is a retired uh, Army officer uh, from the U.S. Army and a former dean in academics at the U.S. Army War College. He is a visiting professor of national security at Dickinson College and a national security consultant for CBS radio and television. During his military career, Dr. McCausen served in a variety of command and staff positions, both in the United States and Europe, during the Kosovo Crisis and Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. He is a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, the Army Airborne and Ranger Schools, the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, and he holds a, both a master's and a PhD from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tufts University. We are also joined with Colonel retired William Tom Bossler. Uh, Tom uh, is also an Army officer who served in the Army from 1968 through 1998. He commanded an infantry patroon in Vietnam and a mechanized infantry battalion uh, task force in Germany prior to the fall of the Berlin uh, Wall. His military education includes graduation of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, the U.S. Army War College. Tom taught military history, strategy, and leadership at the U.S. Army War College, and he is the former director of the U.S. Army Military History Institute at Carlisle Barracks, the forerunner of the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center. Since 1998, he has worked as a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg, where he specializes in battlefield studies and leadership seminars for the U.S. military, as well as military units in Germany, the United States, France, and Kingdom, and many corporations. Tonight, they're here to talk about what they've drawn from years of staff rides at Gettysburg. Please hold your questions to the end and use the question and icon uh, icon. Thank you. Tom and Jeff, the floor is now yours. Thanks very much, Mike. Let me share a screen here and we'll get going. And first of all, it's a great honor and pleasure to be invited by the Army Heritage Education Center Foundation, our good friend Mike Perry, to talk about this book, Battle Tested, that Tom and I have written, talking about uh, leadership lessons for 21st century leaders and using, if you will, the case study of the Battle of Gettysburg. Tom and I have had the good fortune of working together for a number of years at the War College and subsequently, and as part of a company I run called Diamond Six Leadership and Strategy, we conduct executive leadership workshops uh, around the country uh, and frequently use uh, Gettysburg as a classroom to talk about leadership, believing as we do that the leadership lessons, concepts, and principles illustrated in the battle are as impactful to 21st century leaders as they were for those leaders back in 1863. Certainly we use the Gettysburg battlefield because there's no doubt about it, the American Civil War was enormously a transformational event in the history of the United States and one of the most impactful events in American history without a doubt. I often like to say to people, Ken Burns, the award-winning documentary writer and producer, once said that uh, about the Civil War that everything before led to the Civil War and everything after it was a, was a consequence. And we see that even today in the 21st century and many things that occur across this great country of ours. So let's jump into this. To begin with, if you're going to talk about a book and on leadership and use a historical example, it always seemed appropriate to us that you should have a definition of leadership. We selected this one, provided to us by a pretty doggone good leader, Dwight Eisenhower, former uh, five-star general. He only had a handful of those, as everyone on this call, I'm sure, is aware. President of the United States for two terms, and historians today treat the Eisenhower presidency a lot better than he did when Ike departed office in 1960. And many of you may not realize Eisenhower was also a leader in education, being the president of Columbia University for a number of years following his retirement from the military and prior to becoming president of the United States. And he talked about leadership in the following terms, the ability to decide what has to be done and then get people to want to do it. And in our discussion of leadership, we like to differentiate because we believe it's necessary management and leadership. And you see here, of course, management about those things, work standards, resource allocation, organizational design, controlling complex institution. And the primary focus on uh, study of management begins around the First World War, at least here in the United States, 
And you see that with the advent of master's degrees uh, in business administration at places like Columbia University, Harvard University, and the like. There's certainly a Venn diagram between management and leadership. Effective organizations are well-managed, but they also have to be well-led. Leadership being somewhat different, it has to do with vision, motivation, and trust, moving people and organizations into the future, dealing with change. And I used to work for a general in the Pentagon who used to frequently say, you know, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. But we like to add this particular definition that the bedrock of all this is character, integrity, and ethics. Because one could argue if you took this definition of Eisenhower's, leadership is the ability to decide what has to be done and then get people to want to do it. You would have to classify Adolf Hitler or Paul Pott or Joseph Stalin as great leaders. Because did they determine what they thought needed to be done? The answer to that question would be yes in their twisted minds. Did they convince people to do it and do it in some cases? Uh, very, very enthusiastically. And the answer to that too is also yes. But correspondingly, I think if Eisenhower was joining us on the call tonight, he would reject them as great leaders because that foundation of ethics, character, integrity is missing. And we fundamentally believe that absent that, there's no way a leader of any stripe, be he or she leading a military organization, a corporation, a not-for-profit organization, a religious community or the like, can establish trust in his or her organization. Why might you use Gettysburg? Well, we talk about a number of reasons there at the onset. This iconic event, you know, there's two battles in the history of the United States in which everything hung in the balance on one single day or one single afternoon. We've won, won battles, we've lost battles, but only two really were existential for the future of the nation. The first of those, of course, is Yorktown. If you've ever been to Surrender Field at Yorktown, I think you would understand that. It was a more close run affair than many might think that George Washington and his colonial army were going to be successful prior to Cornwallis perhaps being reinforced. But you lose at Yorktown and the whole, the whole revolution is placed in jeopardy in the future of the nation. Second, of course, is Gettysburg. If the Confederates are successful at Gettysburg, destroy the Army of the Potomac, what happens then? Well, you can spin the history out any way you want to. And of course, many people call this the high watermark or the Confederacy. But one of the figures who will not talk about specifically tonight, which figures large in the tale of Gettysburg, of course, is an army colonel who had been an educator himself coming from the great state of Maine, Joshua Chamberlain, commander of the 20th Maine. And many of you are probably aware of the exploits of the 20th Maine in the defense of Little Round Top on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, which is decisive in preserving the opportunity, at least, for the Union to be successful. Chamberlain will return to the field in 1889 to dedicate a monument to his regiment, which stands there to this very day. And Tom and I visit that. We take corporate groups on the field. He will give a speech, and I like to read this particular excerpt because I think it, it introduces what we try to do so well in trying to use this iconic battle to study leadership. And he said in that speech, in great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass, bodies disappear. But spirits linger to concentrate ground for the future, for the vision of place of souls. And reverent, reverent men and women from afar, and generations that we know not of. And in some ways, I would think you might be talking to us tonight on this Zoom call. Heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them shall come to this deathless field to ponder and to dream. Well, tonight we're going to introduce you to this book and touch on just three leadership principles or concepts, the power of initiative, authority versus responsibility, and communicating a vision to give you a small taste of what we try to do in the book. We talk about an extensive number of leadership concepts and principles, knowing full well that leadership is without a doubt a very complex and nuanced topic. So with that as a brief introduction, let me turn it over to my wingman, Colonel Tom Vossler. Tom, bring these armies to Gainesville. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen out there, um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight, to perhaps some old friends, but certainly some new friends. And, and uh, we're gonna have a great program here for you. So let's go back uh, to 1863. Let's go back to May of 1863. It's the beginning of the third year of the war. Down in central Virginia, there's a big battle fought called the Battle of Chancellorsville, which will be a Confederate victory. Following uh, that battle, there will be a meeting in Richmond by the Confederate senior leadership. 
uh, to decide the future strategy for the war. What are they going to do next, having come off this big victory there at Chancellorsville? As they consider their options, they have to consider uh, not only what's going on in the eastern theater of operations, that is between the Atlantic coastline and the Appalachian Mountains, but also the western theater, out Appalachian Mountains and beyond, out toward the Mississippi. And uh, as they consider the Western theater, uh, there are a couple problems. One in central Tennessee, south central Tennessee is a large uh, Union army commanded by General Rosecrans, had just defeated the uh, had, uh, Confederates at the Battle of Stones River, or also called the Battle of Murfreesboro uh, the previous December. And Rosecrans and his army, now that the, uh, the uh, summer campaign season is, is upon them, they're poised to uh, attack southeast um, to Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is a major uh, transportation hub, railroads for the Confederacy, very involved in moving troops and supplies to support the armies in the field. So Rosecrans' army is set to uh, advance toward Chattanooga. Meanwhile, over on the Mississippi River, uh, Union General Ulysses Grant has uh, transferred his several armies across the uh, Mississippi River and has set siege to Vicksburg, Mississippi, the last major Confederate stronghold on that river. Should Vicksburg fall into uh, Union hands, then uh, the Union forces will have complete control of Mississippi from New Orleans all the way up past St. Louis, Missouri. And so holding on to Vicksburg is a priority for the Confederates, but how to do that? One of their options they consider is to take part of the Confederate troops that had been operating in the east and send them out west, either to reinforce General Bragg, who was opposing General Rosecrans in Tennessee, or to reinforce Generals Pemberton and Johnston in the defense uh, of Vicksburg. Before they make their decision, they call into the room General Robert Edward Lee. Lee is the commander of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. It would have been his troops, part of which would have been sent out west should they pursue that specific course of action. Lee, upon hearing what they proposed, says, no, no, let me take my whole army north uh, across the Potomac into Union territory and see if we cannot have a decisive battle over the Northern Army on Northern soil, a battle so decisive that it would bring an end to the war. Failing that, a battle so decisive that it would embarrass the Lincoln administration to the point that the next year, 1864, Abraham Lincoln is not, not even nominated for a second term as president, let alone elected one. Lee, arguably the foremost soldier of the South at the time, gets permission to bring his 70,000 men, Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, north across the Potomac into Northern Territory. Now I say the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, make no mistake, I think you uh, civil historians, Civil War historians out there know that uh, the Confederates named their field armies after the geographic area in which they traditionally operated. Lee's army traditionally operated in Northern Virginia, hence the name. All 11 Confederate states are represented with soldiers in that army. So Lee gets permission June 3rd, then he'll start moving. So let's follow the Red Arrow as it moves from just north of Richmond from the Rappahannock River in north of Richmond and crosses over the Blue Ridge into the Shenandoah Valley and then marches down the valley crossing the Potomac River on the 16th of June into Maryland. On June 22nd, Confederate forces cross over from Maryland into Pennsylvania. By June 28th, two thirds of the Confederate Army are 20 miles west of a small farming community in South Central Pennsylvania called Gettysburg. The remaining third of the Confederate Army is 35 miles north of Gettysburg on the outskirts of the capital of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg. So that's the Confederate movement. What's going on with, uh, with the Union Army? The Union Army then under the command of, um, um, <laughs> hey, Jeff. Joe me. Hooker. Hooker, Hooker. Yeah, there's a senior moment for you. So under the command of General Joe Hooker, uh, uh, initially when Lee moves from in front of Hooker, uh, his idea is to advance south to Richmond and take Richmond. And uh, when President Lincoln gets word of these, uh, gets word of uh, uh, Hooker's plan, he uh, telegraphs Hooker and he says, no, you cannot, uh, cannot go south uh, uh, to, to Richmond. 
You cannot cross the Rappahannock River. If you do so, Lee will turn back on you and attack you front and rear and, uh, and defeat your army. He said, if his army is moving, you move with it and you maintain a position between uh, his army and Washington. So finally, it's a few days before Hooker gets this fi uh, figured out. He'll start moving, follow the Blue Arrow north. Uh, they'll cross the Potomac River on the 25th of June and crossing then over uh, eventually from Maryland into Pennsylvania. And by June 28th, uh, uh, his army is in the area of Frederick, Maryland. June 28th is a uh, important date because on that date, two things happen. Number one, General Lee, the Confederate commander, gets uh, uh, information from a scout that uh, the, the Federal Army has also crossed the Potomac River and are as close to him uh, and his army as, as, as Frederick Maryland, a lot closer uh, than Lee knew. Lee had allowed his principal cavalry commander, James Ewell Brown Stewart, to uh, take a good share of the Confederate uh, cavalry uh, off, on, uh, off on a separate mission. And so uh, Stewart is not available to give intelligence information to Lee about the location of his opponent. So Lee's much surprised to learn June 28th, the close proximity of his opponent. The other thing that takes place on June 28th is finally President Lincoln has had enough of Joe Hooker. He relieves him of command and three days before the battle begins appoints George Gordon Meade as the new, as the new commander of the Army of the, of, the, of the Potomac, the Federals naming their field armies after their major rivers in which, in which they operated. And so both armies eventually then by June 30th are going to find themselves in very close proximity to this small farming community called Gettysburg. And note specifically that the Confederates got well up into Pennsylvania before uh, the, uh, the, the, the Northern Army catches up with them at Gettysburg. So the Confederates come out of the battlefield from the North and the West, while the Union Army or the Federal Army, if you wish to call it that, comes in from the South and the East. Next slide. So I'm gonna summarize here the first day of battle and then we're gonna move on to the second and third day. But what happens is uh, uh, General John Buford will lead a cavalry division into Gettysburg on June 30th. Uh, his mission with his 2,400 troopers is to screen the forward movement of the uh, Union Army uh, northward from Maryland into Pennsylvania looking for the Confederates. They arrive in Gettysburg the day, the afternoon before the battle. He sends out scouts to verify the enemy location. So they've got a good idea of where the Confederates are, uh, anticipating Buford uh, anticipates that perhaps they're going to advance to try and seize the, uh, the town of Gettysburg, very important because as you can see on the map, there are 10 major roads which come into the center uh, of, the, uh, of the town. Those roads necessary to both armies, uh, given their size, 90,000 in the Army of the Potomac, uh, 70,000, 75,000 perhaps in the Army of Northern Virginia. Between the two armies, 72,000 horses and mules, over 600 cannon hundreds and hundreds of wagons with food, forage, ammunition, ambulances. So the roads are very important. Buford understands this. And what he uh, chooses to do is to establish a force uh, toward the Confederates that is west and north of the town to protect what he believes to be the key terrain. Key terrain, he identified with his practiced eye as a professional soldier, the key terrain being Cemetery Hill and the ridge line that extends south from that cemetery ridge all the way down to the, uh, the two round top hills, little round top and big round top, which are presently off the map. The Confederates do advance the next day as Buford anticipated. Uh, infantry will arrive uh, about mid-morning. Union infantry arrive under the commander General John Reynolds arrives at mid-morning to uh, help defend against the Confederate attacks initially coming from the west and by afternoon uh, also coming from the north. And so the initial deployment of Union forces, uh, you've got about 18,000 Union forces deployed west and north of the town attacked by 28,000 Confederates. And over the course of the fighting of the first day, the, the Union Army is pushed back to a reserve position on Cemetery Hill uh, south of the town. Now, the fighting casualties for the first day, casualties, a collective term uh, denoting killed, wounded, captured, and missing. Uh, Union casualties, 9,000. Confederate, about 7,500. 
And so that will bring, uh, bring the fighting to a close about 7.30, the sun sets over South Mountain. And uh, these guys are not gonna fight at night at this point. Uh, they're gonna, the soldiers are gonna rest on their, on their weapons and try and scrounge something to eat while their, their leaders figure out what's gonna happen next. So we can go to the next chart. It's going to jump, we're going to jump right into, uh, right into the second day. Um, early in the morning of, of uh, July 2nd, of the second day of the battle, uh, General Lee will have uh, one of his staff engineers, Captain Samuel R. Johnston, conduct a reconnaissance of the, uh, of the area. And we can see, uh, we can see the, the line to be established by, by the Union Army, Culp's Hill to Cemetery Hill, down Cemetery Ridge to... Uh, to uh, Little Round Top. Uh, that line had not been yet fully established when Captain Johnston made his reconnaissance ride early in the morning. He comes back and tells Lee that, the, that, that there's an open flank here on the south end of the, of the, of the Union line that is subject to, subject to attack. L based on that information, Lee will then order a, a basically a, a double envelopment, General Longstreet to make a main attack against the, uh, the uh, left end of the Union line, uh, General Yule to make an attack against the right end of the Union line at Culp's Hill. Now, I, I prepared down this map, but you can see the dash line represents the line that should have been extended down the ridge to Little Round Top. Forward of it to the left is a solid line that was the line that will actually be occupied. That line is the line occupied by the Third Army Corps under the command of uh, General Daniel Sickles, 10,000 men. Sickles chooses uh, not to uh, abide by the orders he was given. Instead, he will uh, advance about three quarters of a mile forward of his assigned position all the way out to the Emmitsburg Road. And he establishes a uh, defensive line out there. His flanks are wide open. There's no one on his right or his left to, to protect his flanks. And it's a salient that he establishes a, a, a defensive line subject to attack from two directions at the same time. So he puts his men, uh, he puts his men in, a, in a poor position. Before the Confederates uh, resume uh, or make their attack, which is gonna be delayed for reasons we won't discuss tonight, but it'll be four o'clock in the afternoon before the Confederates make their attack. So there's a lot of time on the second day for things to happen. Before the Confederates make their attack, General George Meade, the, the, uh, the commander of the Army of the Potomac, realizes suddenly Sickles is out of position. He rides out to uh, talk with Sickles. What are you doing out here? Sickles tries to explain himself. About that time, the artillery of the Confederate Army preceding their infantry advance opens up and uh, uh, Meade will gallop away and uh, call out to Sickles, I'll send you, I'll send you reinforcements uh, to try and, try and uh, hold the line. And uh, so next chart. Some of the reinforcements that, uh, that uh, um, Meade is gonna send to Sickles will be a four brigade division from uh, the Union Second Corps uh, commanded by General Caldwell uh, and a three brigade division commanded by General Barnes from the Fifth Corps. Um, to the right side of the map there, you can, uh, you can see uh, a uh, U.S. flag representing a brigade commanded by Colonel Strong Vincent, leading the, the three brigades of Barnes's division. They're under orders to go to the wheat field to reinforce Sickles in the wheat field, trying to, uh, trying to stem the, uh, the Confederate attack as the Confederates attack uh, against the area of the Devil's Den, uh, across the Rose Farm, through the wheat field, the Peach Orchard, all the way up the Emmitsburg Road, the Sherfee Farm, all that area will be under attack. So this reinforcing uh, division from, from General Barnes is on their way to the wheat field. Uh, and the, the leading brigade in that line is a brigade of 1400 men commanded by, by Colonel Strong Vincent, an attorney from, from uh, Erie, Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, while all that's going on, um, riding up to uh, the hill known as Little Round Top, was the staff engineer of the Union Army, Colonel uh, Governor K. Warren. And Warren rides up to Little Round Top uh, to inspect the defense of the hill and is amazed to find that there's no one there. 
to defend the hill. Um, the, the line is, that uh, was established for General Sickles to extend down Cemetery Ridge included his occupation of a round top, which he, of course, does not do. He leaves it vacant, no one there to defend the hill. And General Warren realizes that the, um, that, that the hill is in danger of being captured by the Confederates. They're going to come around the end of Sickles' established line uh, that is forward uh, from the area of Devil's Den. And so Warren will send uh, one of his aide-de-camps, one of his two lieutenants, in this case, Lieutenant Randall McKenzie, down to try and find uh, someone to send reinforcements to Little Round Top. Now understand that uh, Warren is a staff officer. He has no command authority. The only thing he commands is his own horse and two lieutenants at this stage of the game. So he has no command authority to order troops to occupy this hill. He can only send this lieutenant down to try and find somebody willing to send troops. Go to the next slide. This gives you a depiction in the, in the, in the, in the primary picture there. You can, see, uh, you can see the lieutenant reporting to Colonel Vincent. You can see Vincent's men behind him. And then uh, there on the upper right corner of the picture, you can see the, the little round top. And Vincent uh, recognizes this lieutenant. He knows this lieutenant works for General Warren. And uh, Vincent and Warren had served together in the Fifth Corps before Gettysburg. So uh, Vincent is very familiar with Warren. He trusts him by reputation. He knows this lieutenant works for Warren. Vincent asks the lieutenant, Lieutenant, do you have orders? And the lieutenant says, yes, sir. Gen uh, General Warren uh, needs infantry on yonder hill to defend it. So here's Vincent. Well, what's he going to do? He's under orders to go to the wheat field to reinforce failure in the wheat field. Here's new information from a trusted source from a person he, he uh, respects. New information sounds to be pretty critical. What's he going to do? Is he going to go to a little round top or is he going to fulfill his standing orders? Subject to court martial if he fails, you see. And so what he's going to do is he is uh, going to lead his brigade of 1,400 men, four regiments, round to the east side of Little Round Top, climb to the summit, and be there to receive the Confederate attack when it comes. Jeff. Thanks, Tom. And of course, this is one of the first leadership principles we're going to talk about tonight, and that is initiative. You know, frequently when I've done leadership workshops for corporations and stand sit in front of a bunch of corporate leaders, I'll ask them, uh, how many of you want to have initiative amongst the people on your team within your organization? And every corporate leader will raise their hand. And I said, great, how many of you uh, are doing something to create a climate for initiative in your organization? And oftentimes they look a bit perplexed. And that's one of the key things that leaders need to do, create a climate where people feel comfortable in taking initiative. Because we firmly believe one thing you've got to do is have a climate where people lead from where they are in the organization. They feel a sense of empowerment to take action as the situation changes. And those of us who've been in the military know that old adage, true in the military, true in other organizations, that no, no plan survives the first round fire. And as soon as that occurs, you have to adapt accordingly. So Vincent has this conundrum. His orders move his unit up there to support this, uh, this defense for General Sickles, which is not going very well in the wheat field and the peach orchard. But uh, he can make quick assessment of the situation for the overall, uh, for the overall goodness of the entire organization and it sizes up that this particular hill is in fact critical. We like to say that what he does is he observes, he orient, he decides, and he acts. And that particular concept, that paradigm, observe, orient, decide, and act, comes from this gentleman right here. His name was John Boyd. John Boyd was a fighter pilot during the Korean War. He'd been very, very successful as a fighter pilot. Will return to the United States when the war is over and become a trainer for future fighter pilots in the United States Air Force. Uh, he will create this concept, this paradigm, observe, orient, decide, and act in training fighter pilots for aerial combat. And his basic argument would go like this. The key to success is observing the environment in which you are operating. In. Orient on what is the key thing that is going on in your organization right now or going on in that particular time and space for your organization. What is the key thing? Make a decision against that and act on that and do that more quickly than your opponent in battle or your competition in business. And if you do so, 
you have a much better chance to be successful. And you see the circle there, observe, orient, decide, and act. You could also say this comes from another book or concept described in the book Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. For those of you who have not read Blink, I, I do recommend it, but to summarize it quickly, Gladwell's essential argument is decisions that you take very quickly are oftentimes every bit as good, if not better, than the ones you ponder on and take an enormous amount of time, realizing that time is the one resource that leaders need to preserve because time is ultimately an invaluable resource and it's the one resource that is the most inelastic. There may be more money, more people, more capital items, it's not a problem. Oftentimes, there is not more time. So clearly, Strong Vincent exercises an initiative, exercises the OODA loop, observes what's going on, orients on the key thing, which is a little round top, makes a decision against the battle on that terrain, and makes an action, and arrives on that hilltop only a scant period of time before the first attack by the Confederates on that hill. And of course, it'll be a little round top that Joshua Chamberlain that I mentioned at the onset of this talk will great, gain great fame with the 20th Maine. Tom, what happens to good old strong Vincent, Tom? Well, he, he will, as I said, uh, lead his four regiments, the 20th Maine, the 83rd Pennsylvania, the 44th New York, and the 16th Michigan, two, uh, two little round top. They do receive the initial Confederate attack. And quite frankly, uh, for the fans of Joshua Chamberlain, uh, that doesn't happen if it weren't for strong Vincent. So we hold Vincent uh, as well as Chamberlain in high regard for here. Unfortunately for, for Vincent, uh, he does not survive the battle. Uh, he is there with the men of the 16th uh, Michigan, which are being pressed back by the Confederate attack, and he is mortally wounded. And uh, it, it'll take a couple of days for him to die, but he does die. He'll be promoted on his deathbed to Brigadier General Strong Vincent High School in Erie, Pennsylvania will be named for him, and it's all glorious stuff. But uh, he does uh, he does die uh, in the in the process, uh, and uh, they will hold the hill. Little Round Top stays in, in, in Union hands for uh, for the remainder of the battle. The Confederates are frustrated in their attempt to uh, to, to uh, capture the hill. They take a lot of casualties in their attempt, uh, so it becomes a bastion uh, of defense on the left end of the, of the, of the Union line, uh, down, down at the end of uh, South End of Cemetery, Cemetery Ridge. So the fighting will continue on. There'll be more Confederate attacks through the course of the, the, course of the second day. Um, General Ewell's attack against the right end of the line at Culp's Hill proves to be indecisive. They capture part of, but not all of Culp's Hill. There are some problems in, in the timing of the attack. Um, and the, the, there's only one small breakthrough uh, by a Georgia brigade in the center of the line. Um, and that breakthrough is going to be repulsed, it's going to be shoved back. But that small breakthrough is going to convince the Confederate commander, Lee, that the Yankees were strong on the ends of their line, on the left end at a little round top, on the right end at Culp's Hill. They can't be strong everywhere given the principles of war. If they're going to be strong there, they must economize their forces somewhere to gain that strength. So they must be weak in the center of the line. Next chart. So in the morning of July 3rd, uh, Lee will travel down on his horse to the Peach Orchard, seeking out his old war horse, James Longstreet. And he and Longstreet will have uh, a brief conversation. Lee will order Longstreet to conduct an attack. Uh, in fact, in Lee's after action report, he writes of the third day, he writes that the plan for the third day was little changed from the plan for the second day. So he wants Longstreet to renew the attack against principally, initially the left end of the, of the Union line with his two divisions that he had attacked with the previous day, plus George Pickett's division a fresh division under Longstreet's command that had not fought yet in the battle, had just arrived on the battlefield late in the day, July 2nd. And uh, they're the only fresh division of infantry of the nine divisions of infantry available to, to Lee. Lee tells Longstreet, take the two divisions you attacked with yesterday and Pickett's division, attack the left of the Yankee line. 
Longstreet replies, General Lee, the two divisions I attacked with yesterday were heavily handled, taking a lot of casualties. There are no conditions to attack again today, besides which if we move forward from where we are now, the Yankee cavalry get around behind the rear and attack us in the rear. He says, very well. He says, I'll give you two divisions from AP Hill's Corps. Take them and Pickett's division and attack the center of the line. Longstreet disagrees with this. Uh, again, he disagrees strongly. He objects to making the attack. Uh, and he tells Lee forthrightly, he says, no 15,000 men are ever ready for battle can carry that position. And he overestimated the strength of what he was going to get, only 12,500 rather than 15,000. Next chart, please. So um, let me set on the map, let me set the, the Union defense. Here we are just south of, the, south of the town. You can see Cemetery Hill and you can see the, the shape uh, uh, of the fish hook as it extends down, uh, cemetery, down Cemetery Ridge, headed down toward the, toward the round tops. This is the center of the line, what we choose to call the angle because of the angle there of the stone wall that had existed there at the, at the time. And so that's the position that are gonna be occupied by, um, by the Union forces in blue. In red, here's Longstreet. Uh, he's, got, uh, he's got Pickett's division organized of three brigades, Armistead, Kemper, and Garnet uh, will attack. Uh, in addition to uh, Pickett's division, There'll, there'll be two other divisions from AP Hill's Corps as Lee promised and uh, commanded by General Pettigrew. Uh, he's in charge in, in uh, place of General Henry Heath, who's wounded out of action. General Isaac Trimble will command um, uh, a, a brigade in support um, of them. And they will all make the attack against the center of the Union line, which will take place in the afternoon um, after a two-hour artillery bombardment, uh, which begins just after one o'clock. And uh, so you've got 12,500 Confederate infantry advancing across 1.1 mile, uh, mile of open ground. What did it look like? You can see in the top picture there on the right, this is the picture from the Confederate, uh, a forward Confederate artillery position, a uh, picture of the open ground, looking over to uh, the copse of trees which marked at that time uh, the center. Those are not the original trees, but that's where they grew. Uh, that was the physical reference point for the advance of the Confederate soldiers. So you can see it's, it's wide open. And then on the bottom picture, you can see here's one of the uh, defending Pennsylvania regiments uh, at the angle. And you can see the ground, open ground all the way over to uh, the wooded area of, of Seminary Ridge, one, just over one mile away. And so that's how it looked. So the attack, as I say, will, will begin after two, uh, two hour artillery bombardment in the afternoon of July 3rd. Next chart. What was presented to the Union gunners of the artillery on uh, Cemetery Ridge? Uh, my buddy Jeff was an, uh, an artillery officer. And so he, uh, he appreciated what we call a target rich environment. Uh, so as the, as the lines upon line of Confederate infantry advance across the fields, uh, the Union gunners are pouring artillery fire long range into the ranks of the Confederates. If you were in the Confederate ranks that afternoon, you'd have heard leaders using phrases like homeboys, home. Home is just over that hill, meaning that slight hill there on Cemetery Ridge. If they can capture that, win the battle, end the war, then go home. Keep moving forward, then the firing can't, can't last much longer. So the ranks keep pressing forward, taking casualties all the while. The battle line that was initially a mile wide from south to north is going to shrink and it's going to move, move toward the center as they continue to take casualties. They get to the Emmitsburg Road where stout post and rail fences on either side of the road are going to impede their movement. They have to climb or push down those fences, come across the road, and then make their attack uh, against the Union uh, position along the stone wall uh, at the angle. And by the time they get across the road and make that attack, the line that was once a mile wide is now only a quarter of a mile wide, just to give you an idea of the casualties. And this picture here represents General Armistead had taken off his hat, stuck it on the end of his sword, called out, who will follow me over the wall? And uh, the Confederate attack 
Confederate attack is going to be uh, defeated. Armistead will be shot down, mortally wounded. He'll die in a Union hospital the next day. Uh, the, the, uh, we lead, he led about 300 men over that stone wall. All of them are killed or captured. Pickett's charge is defeated. The survivors will make their way back, uh, back to uh, back to Union line, back to uh, Confederate lines, back to their starting position. And on the way back, in in Pickett's division, it's alleged that that Lee on his horse will ride up as Pickett has been dismounted, and is walking back with his men. And and Lee rides forward. He says, General Pickett, General Pickett, look to your division. And, and Pickett looks up at Lee and says, General Lee, I no longer have a division. Jeff. Thanks very much, Tom. This iconic scene here shows Robert E. Lee, as Tom described, encountering those survivors of Pickett's charges. They make their way uh, back across the field towards Seminary Ridge. And this is the second principle we're going to use for tonight for this brief overview of leadership concepts and principles from our book, Battle Tested. And that is the difference between authority versus responsibility. I think leaders must fundamentally understand this. Authority is something we have to give out to others. And as we move up to higher and higher positions of responsibility, we know we must give more authority to others because we can't do everything. We can't do everything. It's just not possible, particularly if you're leading a very complex organization. But responsibility rests with the leader. You can give out authority, but responsibility rests with you. You know, I spent my 30 years in the United States military and the Army. But this was really underscored to me, strangely enough, when I spent some time teaching at the United States Naval Academy and got around sailors and Marines for a while. Because the culture of the maritime world talks a great deal about the responsibility of the captain of a ship. And in the Navy, a young officer <clears throat> will become a, a, a surface warfare officer, a SWO, after he or she passed a whole bunch of testing and they're awarded their SWO badge, which they proudly wear on their chest. What that tells you, if you see them in uniform, is they now are trained and have been given the authority to be responsible for the ship, to stay and watch on the bridge, because a captain on a long voyage cannot be on the bridge 24-7. But obviously, if that young ensign, that young lieutenant, is there on the bridge late at night, and the, sh and the ship strikes another ship, or strikes a reef, or strikes a an iceberg or whatever it might hit. Obviously, that's not going to do great things for that particular young officer's career, but only the authority and what I, my rest with them, but the responsibility still rests with the captain who trained that person and certified them for those particular, those particular efforts uh, as a responsibility for the team. Let's move beyond the battle. Tom and I think that if you're going to talk about Gettysburg and get the most out of Gettysburg and leadership experience, you need to talk about the battle, but you also need to talk about the speech, the speech being a critical part of the story of Gettysburg. We know that the decision is made to create the first national cemetery at Gettysburg, and a decision is further made to do a, a ceremony inaugurating that particular cemetery, and the date of 19 November 1863 is selected. Abraham Lincoln will receive his invitation on the 2nd of November. Uh, and as you can see here from Governor Curtin, this particular invitation asked him to make a few appropriate remarks. He's not the principal speaker. The principal speaker is a guy named Edward Everett. And Edward Everett was a very renowned uh, speaker in the day, an orator. He had been governor of Massachusetts. He had been ambassador to the United Kingdom. He had run for the vice presidency on the Union Party ticket in 1860 as an opponent of Lincoln's. And oddly enough, Edward Everett will receive his invitation back in September. So Lincoln knows he's not the primary guy, and he's only getting his invitation about 10 days, or about two weeks, I guess, prior to the actual event. But he will decide to go in any event, this being an important event, and David Wills, you see here in the photograph, of being the person in charge of the ceremony uh, as directed by Governor Curtin. Here's Edward Everett. He is that uh, order I spoke of. Uh, Edward will will speak for exactly two hours or more. And he will describe the entire battle to the estimated crowd, which reached about 15,000 as best we can tell. John Burns, the gentleman you see in the upper right-hand corner, was Mr. Lincoln's escort uh, when he arrives at the train station there in Gettysburg on the afternoon of the 18th of November. We'll stay overnight at the Wills House. Uh, Burns being a very distinguished sort of town curmudgeon, he having been a veteran of the War of 1812, 
but grabbed his musket and headed out to McPherson's Ridge on day one of the Battle of Gettysburg, volunteering to fight for the Union. He, he is wounded during the battle and becomes kind of a folk hero and curmudgeon in the town of Gettysburg. We think that the speech, the Gettysburg Address on the 19th of November, one of the most iconic speeches in the English language, one of the only speeches I know of, which has been actually uh, made into, a, made into a, a statue and a monument at several locations. It only has 272 words, takes the average person about three minutes to say it. But it's a classic description by a leader of the evolution of a vision for his or her organization. And any leader can take away from this organization of the speech uh, a framework that they can use uh, for this particular event. I would argue Lincoln as well from this idea of communicating a strategic vision, the third and final leadership insight we'll talk about tonight, also is the master of timing. You know, I mentioned early on how important time is and how a leader has to think on management of time for his or her organization. But there's also timing. When is the right moment to do something? And I think in this case, Lincoln realized that this was the right moment to, to communicate a revised vision for the organization of the United States because everybody would be focused on this event at Gettysburg. All the governors from the North would be there, most of the senators, congressmen would be there, the major newspapers would be there. This would be a focal point, so the timing was perfect to communicate that revised vision. You can take the speech as a classic statement of strategic vision, and you can divide it into three parts. And those three parts are where have we been, where are we right now, and where are we going? A framework that any, any leader can use, any leader can use. Where have we been? Well, four score and seven years ago, if you do the math, takes you back to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution, which, which uh, authorizes slavery to occur and talks about three-fifths of the human being being counted in the Southern states for the representation in Congress. But the Declaration of Independence, which Lincoln thought was the foundational document for the nation, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Where are we right now? We are met on a great battlefield of this war, and it's right and proper that we should be here. Where are we going? Well, we're going to a new birth of freedom, and that is the vision that Lincoln was going to describe. Up until that point, really, the mission, the vision for the American Civil War on the Union side was to preserve the Union. And if you examine Mr. Lincoln's first inaugural address, that's what he talks about. My job is to preserve the Union. He doesn't talk about ending slavery talks about the ending of the expansion of slavery, but not ending slavery as an institution. Many might point to the Emancipation Proclamation, which is announced in the fall of 1862 and signed on January 1st, 1863. But in the Emancipation Proclamation, as someone once said, you know, has the rhetoric of a bill of lading, it's basically a legal document in which has chief executive and commander in chief, Lincoln is using the power of the presidency, to end slavery in the states under rebellion to allow, or to prevent, I should say, the South from using free labor, slaves, to prosecute the war. But if you're a slave in Missouri or Kentucky or Maryland or Delaware, it has no effect on you whatsoever. And one can argue that if a state returned to the Union and was no longer under rebellion, one might legally argue they would then be allowed to keep their slaves. But he's talking about a new birth of freedom what he is basically saying is that now the mission, the vision for us in the future is to preserve the Union and free the slaves. These two things are inextricably linked. After Lincoln will end his remarks, he will walk back and sit down. It's alleged or, or said that he'll turn to an aide and say, you know, I don't think that dog hunted too well. He didn't think it went too well. Lincoln did not have the James Earl Jones voice, as best we can tell, described by many. And there's some question, well, how well all 15,000 people could hear that. A day after the speech, however, Mr. Everett, who gave that two-hour address, will write Lincoln a note. And in that note, he said, and I quote, I would be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes, communicating that vision at that precise moment. It also is interesting to note that in the immediate aftermath, Democratic newspapers 
will basically pay in the speech. Republican newspapers uh, realize pretty quickly or, or loud the speech. Overseas, it seems to get more quickly the recognition that it deserves. Here in central Pennsylvania, I always point out that the Patriot News in Harrisburg the reporter at the time covering the speech will say, and I quote, the president made a few idiotic remarks yesterday at Gettysburg and the sooner they're forgotten, the better. And that being said, one has to give the Patriot credit on the anniversary of the speech in 2013, the 150th anniversary of the speech, they will actually print a retraction. So there is a quick overview of Battle Tested, a talk about the battle provided by my ace historian, Tom Bossler, and three leadership principles, which we talk about in the book, along with many, many more. <clears throat> the book, of course, is available at all the normal locations you see right here. Tom and I have also created a, a, a way, if in fact, you should purchase a copy of the book and would like one and you email us directly or to bookplate at diamond6leadership.com. We'll be happy to send you an autographed bookplate. And furthermore, if you have any questions about the book or about what we do in terms of our leadership workshops, you can contact us again at info at diamond6leadership.com or at www.diamond6leadership.com. Let me wrap up and move to questions. I like to think at times, it's like Winston Churchill once said, you know, the farther back you look, the farther ahead you can see, or words to that effect. And I came across this 8th century inscription that comes from a church in Sussex, England, which in many ways, I think, underscores this idea of the importance of a vision that I talked about a moment ago uh, in conjunction with the Gettysburg Address. A vision without a task is but a dream. A task without a vision is drudgery. A vision and a task is the hope of the world. And in many ways, I would argue the American Civil War, the freeing of the slaves, the preserving of the American the Union, and the preserving of the democracy at the time was the hope of the war. With that, I'm, uh, Mike, I'm gonna stop share and open this up and we'll turn it over back over to you to manage any questions you might have. Um, I would ask everybody to, um... Uh, submit questions using the question and answer icon. Uh, first question is how did both armies maintain their supply lines, their logistic lines, despite the, despite the dynamics of the battle? Tom, over to you. Uh, when, uh, when General Meade takes command of the army, he will, he will shift his supply base uh, from Frederick, Maryland, uh, further over uh, east into, into Maryland, where it's more closely uh, accessible by railroad from from Baltimore on up, and uh, so he will be he will be sustained in that way, but not during the battle, uh, because all that shifting around and moving uh, from Westminster from the supply base at Westminster to Gettysburg by wagon, uh, the battle is going to be just about over before he gets uh, any supplies. Understand, both armies are going to be fought out. For the Confederates, uh, they're going to uh, have to uh, fight with what they brought with them because the uh, existing um, uh, lines from Virginia across the Potomac up into Maryland, actually any, uh, any transportation is going the opposite way, carrying food and supplies. 24,000 head of cattle, 22,000 head of sheep, are being sent from Pennsylvania and Maryland down into Virginia to feed the army and the people over the coming winter. And so they are gonna basically have to fight with what they brought with them or what they can in fact secure from the rich farms there in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Next question is, uh, is from me. From me. Um, what's the advantage of using Gettysburg for leadership studies when you bring groups in? What does it offer? Well, the advantage is, you know, to start with, you know, this all goes back to Tom and my days at the War College. And Mike, as you well know, from your many years at the War College, annually we bring War College classes in. Most people on the call may have had some, or a lot I've seen have a, some affiliation with the War College. And early in their time on, on, at the War College, we take the students down and we torture them by taking them on a, on a staff ride on the battlefield. That's just sort of a traditional thing to do. Um, and in many ways, the inauguration of the park, and perhaps Tom can talk about that in a moment, was done to provide military officers the opportunity to do that. 
<clears throat> by preserving that location. And there's a lot of old photographs you'll see when you go down there at the visitor center, not only of the battle, but you'll see in the late 19th century, early 20th century, you'll see officers on horseback using the field as an enormous classroom. So from our time doing that, Tom and I determined that this was an enormous case study of leadership. And yes, you can do a military staff ride, and certainly that's very important for military people, focusing not only on leadership, but also strategy, tactics, maneuver of the operational art, all the things we want military officers to know. But also, if you just talk about it from a leadership concept, uh, it provides you a rich environment to talk about enormous number of leadership concepts and principles. Furthermore, if we took this group of 50 or so people we have here on the call, we went to any organization, corporation, large, or, large church, school district, nonprofit organization, military organization, doesn't matter. And we were allowed full access to talk to everybody, poke around. As some pretty educated folks, after a couple of days, I think we could make some pretty educated comments about how well or how poorly that particular organization was run, led. But if we showed up on a day when the organization was in a crisis, good leadership and bad leadership would stick out much more boldly and bold relief because crisis does what? Compresses time and therefore good and bad leadership is much clearer to see. And as a consequence, uh, using a battle like Gettysburg uh, allows you to do that and study those good and bad leadership uh, principles, how they're executed, I should say, by people on both sides. And finally, of course, as I said at the onset, Mike, as you well know, this is an iconic event. Uh, people around the country, the vast, vast majority, I hope still are familiar with the American Civil War, at least knowing it happened. When you get inside that and ask the second question, they probably have heard of Gettysburg. Thank God they made a movie. Uh, but if you talk about Antietam <laughs> or, or, or Shiloh, a lot of people get pretty, pretty, you know, they get a little, have much more difficulty. So you can assume at least some degree of familiarity. And then last but not least, we take advantage of our geographic proximity. But Tom and I have expanded off this. We have done uh, leadership workshops uh, using Antietam. We've used Bull Run. Uh, I've gone on and used uh, the Battle of the Alamo down in Texas with some Texas or, uh, organizations down there, corporations. And then we also do a very successful leadership workshop uh, using the attack on Pearl Harbor, which we do in Honolulu or can do anywhere using video. Tom, you anything you want to add? Uh, you, got, uh, you got it right there. I just like to point out that this is uh, Gettysburg compared to other Civil War battlefields. Uh, this is perhaps the most well marked and most well preserved. It was established in 1895 as Gettysburg National Military Park under the administration until 1933 of the U.S. War Department. And so during the War Department years is when the markings, most of the marking of the battlefield, the monuments and the memorials, uh, initially five observation towers, all that put in to mark the, the uh, offensive and defensive lines of, of the opposing armies. So it, uh, for the visitor, whether they're a casual visitor to the battlefield or whether they come to take part in one of our seminars, or they come to take part for a detailed study of the battlefield, uh, are well served by what's here. Yeah, this next question is, is, is would drive our friend Carol up, up the tree. <laughs> it, it deals with um, uh, Sickles' mispositioning on day two, uh, that in fact, it probably messed up Longstreet's attack at the same time, it spelt disaster. So what were your comments about uh, uh, Sickles positioning on day two? Go ahead, Tom, he's my favorite general, so I'll take uh, Yeah, <clears throat> just very fond of Daniel Sickles. Um, the Sickles question is perhaps one of the top two or three uh, debates that accentuate this battlefield. Some say, that his uh, disregarding his orders and moving forward is going to, in fact, disrupt Longstreet's attack and uh, unintentionally uh, create a, a, a battlefield, a defense in depth, which was uh, 20th century military doctrine in Europe, you see, uh, defense in depth. But Sickles does this by accident. 
and the Confederates are therefore going to lose a lot of casualties, a lot of time in attacking through the position uh, and pushing. You know, Sickles came forward with 10,000 men, only 1,500 are, are capable of, uh, are combat effective by the time they are pushed by the Confederates back to their original line of where they should have been. And Sickles is not one of them. That's another story for another time. So that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that he, he almost gave the whole thing away by what he did, by his lack of coordination, by placing his troops in such a vulnerable position. Uh, he compromised, potentially compromised, um, the entire uh, plan of battle for the Army of the Potomac. And had the Confederates punched through, he certainly would have been the goat that they hung the bell on. But the Confederate attack ran out of steam before they could break through at Cemetery Ridge. And so, you know, people swing back to the, to the, to the first argument. Yeah, well, he created that defense in depth that bled the Confederates dry and stopped the, stopped the attack. If you're favorably disposed to Stickles, you might uh, attribute to him the same thing I talked about for Strong Vincent, taking initiative, and that is moving forward. Uh, one could also say it was a function of the fact that by that time, the 2nd of July, George Gordon Meade has been commander a whole four days. So Sickles, as a corps commander, might have felt he had a lot more latitude than if he had been still under the command of Joe Hooker, who was a lot more centralized control and been in command for a longer period of time. One could also argue, perhaps, back to that resource of time that inadvertently, at least, or accidentally, or however you like to describe it, he provides a bit more time for Vincent to do what he does. And if they had stayed in place, perhaps the Confederates might have been able to attack Little Round Knot Top more quickly, which, oh, by the way, he had not secured, he sickles, and as a consequence, secured that key terrain, and everything would have been very different. I also like to think, frankly, though, it's something like my father told me when I was a child, when he said to me, son, if you have a choice between being lucky or good, always pick lucky. So in this case, at least, I would say as, de as decisive as this was, and the horrific casualties his course uh, uh, received, he was lucky in his, that his reputation was somewhat preserved through some of his own writing, by the way, in newspapers using pseudonyms. And he will eventually, because he's well politically connected as a former congressman, uh, to get a Medal of Honor. The final thing I'll say about Sickles is uh, not to go through his long and illustrious career. By the way, he's the only non-West Point Corps commander uh, in the Union Army. He having become a Corps commander because Abraham Lincoln appointed several generals, as uh, Democrats as generals, one way to keep the team together, one way to build cohesion, pick some of your adversaries and make generals. He did that. Uh, Sickles, a very influential member of the Tammany Hall political machine out of New York, was one of those. So Sickles became a general because of his political connections. But a rather very uh, interesting career, kills his wife lover in Lafayette Park on, on a sunny afternoon um, and manages to plea, use the plea of a temporary insanity for the first time in U.S. legal practice to get off. Makes his way to Spain, insults the king of Spain as the ambassador and is run out of there. It's alleged he then becomes the ambassador to the Ottoman Empire and is found on, in the harem of the emperor of the Ottoman Empire and has to flee there. Spends a couple years as ambassador without portfolio wandering around Europe to return to the United States to be reelected and taught to Congress. And it's further alleged that if you examine the monument there on the field of Gettysburg to the uh, Union Third Corps, you will notice in the center, it looks kind of vacant because there was supposed to be a bust of Dan Sickles in the center of the monument. And it is alleged that he embezzled a large portion of the money for the monument. And that's why his statue is not there. Perhaps underscoring at the end of all this, what I said at the onset, that ethics, character, and integrity are the bedrock of good leadership. And you can learn as much, unfortunately, from bad examples as you can from good examples. Mike. Do you ever discuss uh, with Sickles his prior experience, say, at Chancellorsville, how it shaped? That too. And that, in a sense, how, how corporations or businesses can be shaped by prior experiences, which makes them fail to see uh, other op options uh, in the course of events. Yeah. 
Uh, this question is from John. It's a little bit long. I've seen examples that if the CEO believes that their culture and leadership are excellence, sometimes they come blind to the possibilities of making it better. And at the same time, the level below C CEO drinks the Kool-Aid and believes it cannot get any better. Are there any lessons from Gettysburg about a level or two below the CEO or general where things at the top could have been improved by the level or two below, in a sense, whether subordinates could have done better? Or, uh, and if so, what can we learn as leaders specific to removing blind spots? Well, I would, I'll, I'll take a, a hack at that and then Tom, I'll turn it over to you. But I think I've got the general direction, John, you wanna go. Uh, we think that there's an incredible uh, um, way to look at leadership style by using the battle as a case study. Because you've got this sort of odd two leaders that are very, very different. On the one hand, you have Robert E. Lee. Robert, Robert E. Lee, by 1863, as I like to describe, he's a rock star. This guy's an icon. He'd been basically a hero in the Mexican War. He'd been one of the leading figures uh, in the Federal Army prior to the American Civil War. He'd been the superintendent at West Point, all those great things. Uh, he becomes the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia. And by the time you get to Gettysburg, he's been in command about 14 months. And he's been wildly successful. Uh, he's only had really one tie. And that, of course, was Antietam. Uh, and the rest of them have all been victories. And he's coming off of a victory there at Chancellorsville, uh, which almost destroyed the entire Union Army. So he's a rock star. But to get to your point, John, he's in a bit of a problem, though. And the problem is, who in the organization at the level below the rock star can go to him and say, this is the dumbest idea I've heard this week. That's gonna be pretty hard to do. You've got two new commanders. You've got uh, Richard Ewell and Ambrose Powell Hill, who have been elevated from division to Corps Command shortly before the battle. Corps Command being a much more exponentially uh, level of command. It's hard, you're gonna be them or gonna to go to Lee before the attack on the third day and say bad idea. Jeb Stewart only returns late on the 2nd of July as he's been out on his massive raid. He's not gonna tell Lee he's wrong. Longstreet will attempt to do so, but it's pretty hard to tell, tell an icon that he's wrong. Then you go across the field and you go to George Gordon Meade. Meade um, is picked two days before the battle to be the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Um, he is not the highest ranking general in the Union Army by date of rank. Several of his colleagues outrank him, actually, even though now he is put in command. And probably each one of them thought they were better generals. And they probably, they probably thought they were better looking than Meade was, for that matter. And he knows that John Reynolds, the first corps commander who was killed early in the battle, had actually been offered the command before him. So he's got to get a bit more buy-in. He's got to be a bit more open to listen to ideas uh, to get them to buy into the direction he wants to go. Back to that idea of deciding what has to be done and getting others to want to do it. So iconically on the evening of the 2nd of July of 1863, one of the most important nights in American history, these two guys will ret retire to their headquarters, both of which by the way were, were widow homes that respective Confederate Union Army have absconded with for the battle. <clears throat> Robert E. Lee, the icon, will basically keep his own counsel, talk to a couple staff officers, but he will not talk to his immediate subordinates and get any input. The icon knows what he's gonna do. George Gordon Meade will call all his corps commanders, his commander of artillery, his chief of staff, and his commander of cavalry in uh, for a big meeting. He will ask them what they think that we ought to do. And his chief of staff will eventually call for a vote on three options. We retreat, we attack, or we tend to defend in place. And they decide that each commander will vote in reverse order of their date of rank. So the more junior guy will not be in any way influenced by somebody more senior. So an interesting contrast in leadership style, getting back to your question, John, how do I allow myself to, to not be blind, not to have a, avoid blind spots? How do I solicit information from below? And how do I get in uh, how, how do I get a certain amount of buy-in in doing so? Tom, you want to add anything to that? No, uh, I think you pretty well covered that one uh, on the on the, uh, you know for 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 Lee. I, I would I would just say uh, his 13 months experience up to that point 
his expectations of, of the men in his army are, are very high because if you look back and his experience is uh, they have won every battle and it, in every battle, the Union Army, the Northern Army has retreated after one or two days of fighting. And so at Gettysburg, that is indeed his ex expectation. And he's gonna make uh, decisions based on that. He believes his guys are, uh, uh, can be undefeated. And, and so he's, he's taking a little bit of hubris and mixing up perhaps with some press clippings. And uh, he has overestimated the capability by the evening of July 2nd and the morning of July 3rd. He has overestimated the residual capability of his army. He has uh, underestimated the uh, capability of his opponent, thinking that they're going to react as they've always reacted in battle against him. Um, I think this is a, a bit more uh, in yours, your area. This is from Chuck. Uh, who said uh, he recognizes that this was a complex battle with many moving parts, but you really did not discuss the cavalry action between uh, Custer and Stewart, which may have had a significant impact. Would you care to address? I don't believe it was significant. <laughs> <laughs> it was insignificant. It didn't, it didn't lead to anything. Okay. Except, but, except, I... more, except more coverage. Mark <laughs> can, I, can I add one point to that, Mike? It's not an ancillary point. Okay. And that is what, what I think is strange about this particular battle to a degree is Tom and I have talked about it a lot. He's done the historical research. Really can't find much information where either commander thought through, what am I going to do if this works? Okay. <laughs> In other words, uh, scan evidence that Lee had a carefully thought out plan. If we defeat these guys, this is what we're going to do next. How are we going to exploit this particular success? If we break, if we break through, unless you expect them to dissolve and they just run away, but what are you going to do then? Okay. Uh, they don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about tomorrow. They're tied up thinking about today. Furthermore, on George Meade's side, if he is successful, what are you going to do? And of course, he is, uh, receives enormous criticism after the battle is over. As Lee is able to retreat, uh, Meade does not pursue him vigorously. In fact, we'll send a, a message to Abraham Lincoln in which uh, he will say, "My dear, Mr. President, I have successfully defended the nation from invasion. Lincoln is despondent, will write a letter back to Meade in which he says, my dear general, you can't defend the nation, it's one nation, and you let Bobby Lee get away. But Lincoln will use a, a great example of thinking about leadership at that moment. He writes that letter gets that out of his system, folds it up, puts it in an envelope, puts it in his desk drawer, and never sends it. He never sends it, uh, realizing later on, don't do things when you're angry. But in both cases, why I stress that, back to this whole idea of where, what could you have exploited this, it seems, I, I agree with Tom somewhat, and still I argue almost even futile, but uh, a new book out by Jim Collins called B2.0, which he builds on his very successful career running on leadership. And he talks about the battle of Gettysburg. And he talks about just that. You know, that organizations have a plan and plan and plan and plan a, a major event, a merger or an acquisition or a rollout of a new product or some real big thing, okay? And then they, then they roll it out, but they don't exploit all the possible successes that offers the organization. Before you know it, they're all sort of attracted away on the next bright, shiny object. And he says, what you have to do is when you have a major plan, a major event for your organization, a major change, a major new part of your brand, whatever it might be, and you launch it, the leadership's got to keep everybody focused on that until you maximize all of the advantages that you accrue from that. And oddly enough, I don't see the good deal of evidence. Either side spends a lot of time thinking that through. Uh, this is from uh, William. This is sort of an expansion on uh, the discussion between Longstreet and Lee. Uh, he's asking, what do you think Lee should have ordered at the beginning of day three? Um, Tom, over to you on that one. Well, um, I'll go with uh, I'll go with one of the Confederate officers, Edward Porter Alexander, whose uh, book on his service in the Confederate armies is one of the great ones. Uh, Alexander, who was placed in charge of the artillery bombardment by Longstreet. Uh, for the event misnamed 
in history is Pickett's charge. Um, Alexander says, uh, we attacked at the wrong place. He said that was the fundamental problem. He said we should have attacked at Cemetery Hill, not Cemetery Ridge. We should have attacked in the brief run from the buildings on the south edge of town uh, to, to Cemetery Hill, thus avoiding the um, enfilade artillery fire against our line as we crossed the fields from Seminary Ridge to Cemetery Ridge. So that is, uh, that's, that's part, of, part of my thinking anyway, part of, that's Alexander's thinking. I'm using his, his, his thought process in terms of what they should have done. I think everyone in, in terms of uh, uh, Lee and perhaps some of the others, believed that if, if properly executed, they, they could do it. All they needed, Lee said, was just one more push, one more push. Again, this goes back to the previous question on, on, uh, on, on, on making the attack in the first place. Based on his experience, all they needed was one more push and they'll retreat. And Alexander's words were, uh, we simply attacked in the wrong place. We attacked against their strength of their defensive line, not against the weakness of their defensive line. You know, I'd add to that one other thing, and that is I believe Robert E. Lee really understands one thing better than any of the leaders in the Confederacy. And unfortunately, I don't think he communicates it well. And that is that while they may be winning battles, they're losing the war. They just can't sustain this. Back perhaps that original question about logistics. So when he comes north, he's not coming north to win a battle. It's coming north to win the war. And now we get to the third day, and this is my last chance, again, not to win a battle, to win the war. And we often talk on the field about the difference between risk and gamble, and those two words are not interchangeable. Organizations, leaders take great risk, and you have to understand as a leader, how much risk tolerance do you have? If you have very little risk tolerance, then you do very few things. If you have a lot of risk tolerance, you do you know, a lot more perhaps. Different than a gamble, a gamble is we all go to Las Vegas, we start throwing dice down the table. That's a gamble and God figures it out. But a, but a risk is a calculation of gain with the possibility of loss. And you're not gonna risk the very existence of your organization, military, corporate, nonprofit, over something that's trivial. You're only gonna put it at risk over something that might be of, of enormous value. But I say, again, I think Lee might've been able to galvanize more support for the entire operation, let alone the attack on the third day, if he communicated that frequently to his leadership team. This is about winning the war. And as a consequence, this is what we're all going about. Finally, of course, he's in a tough spot by the third day. Here I am. What can I do? I can retreat back. Last opportunity, perhaps, win the war. I can make it this Antietam II kind of a draw and pull back into Virginia. Um, people say, well, why didn't you maneuver? Well, Part of his problem, of course, is Jeb Stewart arrives late in the day on the 2nd of July, <clears throat> and his men are totally exhausted. They're having to tie cavalrymen in their saddles, keep them from falling asleep and falling out of the, the horses are shot. If you're going to maneuver, you're desperately dependent upon that cavalry to screen that movement, screen the Union Army from hitting your flanks, find the right avenues of advance, find water, all the things that you're going to need. And he knows he just can't sit there. <clears throat> Because as, Do as, you know, as we like to say, as Dorothy said to Toto, we ain't in Kansas anymore. We're in enemy country, so we can't, so I gotta do something. And I come back to that risk versus gamble. And as Tom mentioned, I think quite rightfully, perhaps Lee as the icon is at this point reading his press clippings a little bit too closely. Okay, this is the last question. <coughs> uh, this sort of goes back to uh, what I uh, try to ask uh, about Sickles' prior experience, but they were, this is a very specific question about his experience at Hazel Grove and how that may have influenced him to Gettysburg. Well, his experience, the experience of he and his, his core at, at Hazel Grove at the, during the Battle of Chancellorsville, um, uh, he is going to be placed, he's going to be ordered into a position that is going to put him directly under the guns of, of the Confederate Army to, and, and to uh, then subsequently sustain a great deal of casualties. And so that experience uh, here 
in his mind, let's go back then several weeks to, to Gettysburg, um, the position that he was ordered to occupy along Cemetery Ridge, those of you who have been there will recognize this, as you come down from Little Round Top along the ridge in a northerly direction, you'll see um, some, some low, low ground through there before you get back up to the higher part uh, of, uh, of the ridge, about where the, the, the uh, equestrian statue of General Sedgwick is. So that would have been part of, in addition to Little Round Top, way up here on the left, then down to the right is that, is that lower ground. Forward of that then is a slight ridge out along the Emmitsburg Road in the area of the Peach Orchard. Now, I've, I've measured it on a map that ridge out there in the area of the Peach Orchard is 40 feet higher than the lower ground along Cemetery Ridge, where he should have been, where he was part of his initial position, assigned position, 40 feet. Um, not a great deal at the distance of about maximum range for Confederate artillery from that, from that, from those, between those two positions. Uh, so I think he uses that uh, in defense of, of what he did. Uh, I don't know that it is fully uh, tactically acceptable explanation. And I'd add one other point. You know, I, I would compare, you could say, what Sickles does on there to what, frankly, Jeb Stewart does as the campaign unfolds. And that is Jeb Stewart goes off on this particular long raid. Uh, I think motivated in large measure because of the disaster that occurs to him at, at, at uh, Brandy Station as they're coming north. Uh, he's surprised by Union Cavalry as he's preparing for a grand parade and ball. Uh, it's a draw, but uh, northern newspapers roundly criticize him and damage his somewhat large and fragile ego. And so I'm going to recoup my ego to a large degree by doing this very flamboyant raid around the Union Army and Robert E. Lee. Uh, I think someone reluctantly agrees to that, but tells him to stay in contact with the army, which of course he fails to do. In similar way, uh, Sickles, who certainly had his share of ego as well, when he makes that move and comes forward, does he do that because he thinks it's best for the entire organization or because it's best for Dan Sickles? I think you can argue that obviously uh, endlessly, uh, but it gets back to, you know, what was discussed in really good leadership book, which is Good to Great by Jim Collins. Collins talks about the most successful organizations that he examined, those that really excelled, had so-called level five leaders. And these were people who were totally able to divorce their own personal gain, their own personal ego from decisions they made for the organization. Now, most people would say, well, that's pretty easy to do. Everybody does that. You always devote uh, what is the best choice for the organization. No, that's actually very hard for human beings. We all have an ego. We all need to acknowledge we have an ego. And having an ego is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's part of being a human being. But your ability to divorce, and when you make a decision and say, no, this is best for the organization, may not be best for me personally, really distinguish the organization that Collins thought were most successful and may give us some inkling about those choices made by Dan Sickles. Any closing comments? Tom, Jeff. Tom, Tom go ahead. Oh, oh, great opportunity to uh, talk talk Civil War history and, and, and the, battle, the battle at Gettysburg. And I recognize, we recognize that Gettysburg wasn't the only battle fought. And, and I've spoken with many, many round tables about it. Well, uh, let's do some other stuff. Okay, we'll, we'll do some other stuff. But the fact is, uh, we live here. You know, Jeff and Carlisle, me here on my farm just west of the battlefield. And so, yeah, that's what we talk about because it's here, it's in our backyard and it's immediately accessible. And anyone that's interested, we, we appreciate that interest and, and uh, would be happy to, to uh, include you in, in, uh, in our seminars out here in leadership. And, and uh, so, thank you. If you just want to trounce around a day on the battlefield, they can give you a call. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just want to say, you know, always a great honor and pleasure 
to work with the Army Heritage Education Center. And if you haven't been there recently, you should go by because Mike and the people there are doing some fantastic things. Always a great pleasure to work with my good friend, Mike Perry. I, I want to say, as you see what the Army Heritage and Education Center has become out there, it is largely due to the hard work over the last several decades by this gentleman here, Mike Perry, and my hat is off to him. Yeah, it's going in decades now. I, I said several decades. Okay. It's going on several decades. <laughs> for what he has done for that outstanding institution, so kudos to Mike. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, in addition to if we can be of any assistance to us, please let us know. Uh, should you decide to or you already have, purchase a copy of the book, and if you contact us, we'll happy to send you a book plate. There were several other questions in the inbox there uh, that we didn't get to. If you'd like us to answer them, if you send us an email directly to that info at diamond6leadership.com, or you can send, send it via mic, uh, Tom okay. and I will be happy to address those by email. Okay, so next time we can discuss whether Gettysburg or the fall of, uh, oh heck, uh, oh. Vicksburg was more important. Oh. I was going to say we can, Kabul. We can debate, you know, whether whether it was the the third or the fourth was the significant action. Uh, the answer is the answer is yes. The answer I, is yes. I avoid the debate by combining the two. Right, it's a one-two punch. Well, I, I combine the three. It's Vicksburg. It's Gettysburg as a battle. It's the speech. Okay. Uh, I thanks and uh, Jeff. Thanks for the compliment. But my efforts really were built on uh, efforts going back in the mid 60s, a uh, number of directors uh, prior to me uh, that built the collection, a bunch of civilian and staff, uh, people like John Sloniker, Louise Arnold Friend, uh, Dr. Richard Summers, Dave Keough, who really built the reputation of this place and built the collection. Uh, and then my predecessor, Tom, who started the hard work on, on convincing the Army to. Uh, renovate a new building, uh, which initially then led to the, uh, the development of what we've done. So this organization has been built uh, by numerous people over decades. Uh, I just had the good fortune of trying to expand it and uh, uh, make it uh, one of the two key uh, facilities for the Army. Uh, first being the National Museum uh, down at Fort Belvoir, which is an artifact-centric public facility, but the intellectual heft that provides background to the Army is contained in the archival and library collections here at the AHEC, because we, we mix both archival, library collections, and artifacts, so we can do different things than they can do at the National Museum. Uh, so thanks, but uh, it has been a, a, a long journey for this organization. I would invite everybody uh, who's here tonight uh, to come back in two weeks. Uh, it's not every day that I get the former SAC Ewer, uh, to want to do a presentation, but General George Jowlin, uh, who served from the early 1960s all the way through the about 1998, and his career culminated as this, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. We'll talk about Watchmen at the Gates, uh, his experiences from being a lieutenant to a four-star. So please come back Wednesday, the 8th of September, uh, again at 7 p.m. So good night, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Tom. And we'll see you here shortly. Thanks, Mike. Okay, bye. Thanks, thanks Tom. See you later.